success was every, every kid he coached understood that Joe really cared about him. He had no agenda in coaching. You know, he was all about coaching football and all about making the players he coached better. And, uh, you know, the players that understood that really loved him and uh, would do anything for him, and that, that hadn't changed. Um, second thing I think in coaching, you know, you really got to know your objectives. And, and uh, certainly all of us have a little different objectives, I think, you know, different levels, what have you. But to me, football is football, and, uh, you know, uh, I think you've got to go into it knowing your objectives, and you got to go into it uh, knowing what your audience is and, and uh, you know, what voices uh, the players you, you coach here. You know, I coached in the NFL for six years, and uh, you know, one good thing about the NFL is you, you, know, you don't have to deal with parents. And I know in high school coaching, you know, you're on the front line with parents, and uh, being a little league dad, boy, is that a scary, scary thing. It was one of the most eye-opening experiences I ever had. Our oldest son, Brian, who's now 22, uh, when we moved to Maine back in 1990, uh, played Little League hockey. It was the first time, you know, and Brian, you know, I don't know, he was about seven or eight at that time, I guess, uh, you know, really couldn't skate. You know, he only skated for like a year or something like that. He go up to Maine, I mean, everybody in this kid's all started skating when they uh, come out of the crib. So it was a little different, but it was one of the scariest things I've ever, I've ever been to. Uh, sitting in the, in the uh, audience or the fan, fan base, you know, I'm just a parent watching, watching this kid play hockey. And, and I'm listening to all these comments from these parents, you know. And uh, God, I, I was so scared. You know, I've been coaching. I don't know how many years at that point. One great thing about coaching is you're on the sidelines and you can't hear anything in the stands. And uh, I'll never forget. I'm just hearing all these people screaming, and you know, they're all screaming at their own kid. And uh, again, these kids are in elementary school, and I'm guessing probably 80% of the, the fans there, the parents, you know, they got visions of their kid playing hockey at the University of Maine. You know, 10 years down the road or eight years down the road. And, uh, you know, Maine hockey is kind of like Iowa wrestling. It, it's, it's really good. You know, they've been national champs a time or two, I believe, in the last 10 years. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to these parents and they're putting the pressure on these kids to do this, do that. You know, I'm, I'm doing the math in my head. You know, the, the kids that play for the University of Maine on Friday, Saturday night, they're in the Alphonse Arena. Now, the roster is 98% Canadian, all right? So there ain't kids from Orono, Maine, playing for the University of Maine, yet that's what these people are trying to, you know, they go to the games on the weekend and. Yeah, that's what they're looking at, and I've always believed, you know, uh, you know, kids let kids play for the right reasons. You know, let them play because they want to play. And as they get older, you know, if they have that that drive and that, that passion for the sport, you know, things will work out. You know, your ability takes you so far, and then the passion you have and the work you're willing to put into it, uh, you know, it, it all works itself out. But, but really, it was a, a you know an impacting situation to me because as a coach, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, well, it never it never occurred to me. And you know, what these kids are hearing from home. Uh, and again, going back to the NFL, you know, the good news in the NFL, you don't have any parental influence. The bad news uh, is that you have agents, which are 10 times worse than parents, because you know, every agent's telling their client, you know, these coaches don't know crap, they don't know your skills and ability, they're just not using your talents. You know, so you got guys coming in your room all pissed off at you. Uh, but that, that's kind of a different realm. But my point there is, you know, I, I think athletes at every, uh, every age have voices in their air, you know, they're all watching ESPN, you know, the Dick Vitale, di you know, Diaper Danny glorifying individuals, all that stuff. So, you know, as coaches, we're all combating that, and I, I think you gotta, you know, you gotta keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing I really believe in, and, and again, this goes back to my mentor, Joe Moore, you know, to me, coaching is, is, you know, you're coaching people, and then you're coaching techniques and fundamentals. And, you know, assignments are important, I understand that, and, and you know, our, our, you know, we let our guys know if they don't know what they're doing out there, if they don't know what to do, all right, you know, they, they can't play for us because they're, they're going to get somebody hurt. They're going to lose us ball games. So I'm not saying, you know, a player doesn't have to know what to do. That is extremely important. Uh, but as important as assignments are, to me, teaching fundamentals and techniques is critical, and I believe that's true in every position. I really believe that. And if you come visit us in Iowa, and, and some people in the room have been down to our place, and I always kind of chuckle when people come in and out because they probably leave really underwhelmed uh, after they watch us practice. Because, you know, really nobody on our staff, you know, we don't pretend to be gurus or geniuses or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, one thing we really try to do is teach fundamental football. We want our guys to be fundamentally sound. And, and system-wise or scheme-wise, uh, you know, we really believe in, and to me, again, it gets back to knowing your audience. You know, you can only give your guys uh, a realistic amount. And what you can do in pro football when you have guys in uh, meetings uh, three and a half, four hours in the morning, you know, it's a little different than what you can do in college or in high school you know, where you're not going to have that kind of meeting time. And 
Now, I also believe the pro football is changing a little bit now. It's not like the old days where you have, uh, you know, the 49ers or you have the uh, uh, Redskins or the Steelers, you know, where those teams stayed together for six or eight years. Or you, know, you wonder why Bud Grant was able to always bring his teams into camp, and, you know, right at the end. Well, he had veteran teams. He was smart. You know, he was way ahead of his time, in my opinion. You know, he didn't beat the guys up in camp because he knew he had a veteran team that, you know, where most of the guys knew the system and all that stuff. So, yeah, there's some real genius there. But I, I think I guess what I'm saying there is, you know, our, our philosophy is, you know, rather than having our guys tied up mentally, we want to make sure they uh, have a system and we have a system that's teachable, learnable, and then we like to really focus on, you know, knowing what the right adjustments are. All right, to, to all the things that they're going to see offensively, defensively, or on special teams, and, and then get back to where we can really, you know, kind of try to coach up the techniques and fundamentals. And uh, you know, I'll give you two quick examples of that. You know, one, one thing that uh, is actually in my mind, I go back to it was 1986. We had a guy, Dave Croston, who was a fifth year senior, we're in spring ball. And uh, David started uh, two years going into this, his third year of senior, he's a three year starter, force of left tackle. Got drafted by the Packers, I think it was third round. Uh, you know, very good college football player. Ended up having some shoulder problems up there and it never really, uh, uh, he hadn't had an extensive NFL career. But Dave was one of the more uh, uh, consistent, technique sound guys that I'd ever coached. Uh, and to this day, same way, really smart. You know, just a guy that really worked at and was very, very solid. And we're out there one, uh, one day in the spring, just doing a simple punch drill, which will be on tape later on. And uh, it was like fourth, fifth day. And I don't know what happened to him, but it just, boy, he just went haywire. He, he looked like he had never been coached. And, and it made a great impression on me because, you know, here's a guy that knows how to do it. And he's done it many, many times. For whatever reason that day, he wasn't there, you know. And, and uh, so my point is, you know, I, th I think you just you don't take things for granted. you got to keep working the drills that are important. You know, baseball and the great hitters, they all hit balls. And that's what they do. The great shooters in basketball practice, you know, I remember reading about Larry Bird going to the arena a couple hours before they, uh, the team had to be there just to get a shooting in. All the great hitters do it and, and what have you. Uh, and I'll flash forward. You know, I, I was out of town, uh, I guess it was Wednesday night. Uh, I'm going to lose track of days here. Recruiting is kind of coming down the home stretch. But our basketball playing the team played Minnesota. It was a three overtime game the other night. I didn't get to see it. I wasn't in town. Uh, but I flipped on ESPN that next morning and, I'm, and they showed some highlights. And some of you guys may have seen it. Minnesota had a kid on the free throw line with you know 15 seconds left, something like that. You know, free throw if he makes it, you know they, they win the ball game uh, the way it turns out. But they, they show this graphic. This kid is a 17% free throw shooter. 17%. I don't know. They make no check is. He blows my mind too. All right. What's he? Uh, but he's like 50, I'm guessing, right? Which oh, stinks. 45. I know he stinks at free to shoot free throws. I can say it because he's not here. All right, but uh, he's always amazed me. But but this guy here, I mean, you know, this guy's playing for Minnesota, 17 percent. All right, now, you know, here's a guy that's a Division One athlete. He's playing at the University of Minnesota Big Ten basketball. The guy's got to be a hell of an athlete to do that. I mean, not anybody can do that. And you know, it just blows my mind. You know, maybe it's a mental thing, but I'd venture to say you could take, you know. 50% of your student body, your schools, and train them for a month, and they could shoot at least 50% free throws. Uh, you know, I never believe you got to be a great athlete to do that. Uh, yeah, it helps certainly, but to me, it's just kind of an illustration of, of things that go on in sports. Uh, I mean, yeah, you pay a heavy price. This guy must be a hell of a rebounder or something. I don't know, but you pay a heavy price to have a guy like that out there on the court, you know, playing for your team. You know, you know he's going to go to the line. And again, I just think that gets back to fundamentals. You know, somewhere along the line, it wasn't important for this guy. Uh, you know, and, and you know, he's been able to make it that far without doing it. So uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. This, but I'll throw a couple if I get this in mind. Okay. I've got to teach him how to do it, and then that gets into the repetition and uh, what have you. You know, players basically have four jobs that they've got to learn what to do, all right? They've got to learn how to do it, you know, what, what's the skill that's involved, and they've got to go out and be able to do it. And, and the, the thing that, uh, going back to, you know, six years in, in the NFL, uh, to me, the thing that really separates, you know, good players from average players or great players from good players is being able to do it all the time. We talked to our guys about, you know, consistency in their performance, and, and uh, you know, I think that's a real trick. Because it's, it's not only you know being able to do it, but then you know being able to do it with some consistency 
and now you're getting into the mental part as well. Um, a couple of things I think about, you know, it's true for all positions, but again, certainly line, line play. You know, strength and conditioning is really important. And I'll go back again you know, to my time in, in the 80s. We have a guy, Bill Dervich, who's our uh, director of op. So we figure we got to try to get a match there. Our strength and conditioning coach, Chris Doyle, you know, I don't think there's a better guy in football. I don't care what level you look at. And again, you're, you know, I'll say this later on, you're welcome to come to our place. Yeah, it's worth a trip just to see Chris. I mean, he is outstanding. But we, that's something we really believe when we sell to our players. You know, it's not just about the strength and conditioning. Yeah, that is important. It's critical. And if you don't maximize in that area, to me, it just means you don't care as a player. You know, same thing here. You know, I mean, anybody can have a good stance. So, you know, it starts with your stance. You learn that. And then, you know, as you go through, it's a little tougher. And this is something, too. But these two things, to me, are just work ethic. And then, you know, the skills techniques, you know, you work to be the best you can possibly be with, with what it is you've got. That, that's something we really try to teach to our guys you know, about being uh, well rounded. Okay, and then with linemen in particular, you, know, you can talk about you know what, what's important and all that. You know, to me, things that are really critical for an offensive line are leg strength, you know, the explosion, you know, ability to move, change directions, adjust. Okay, vision, football sense, decision making that ties in with me of understanding. And then you know the bottom line to me, you know, that just differentiates players. You know, at, at any position. You know, I think you can gain a lot of ground here. So, you know, this is, you are what you are. You work hard to develop all this stuff, okay? Uh, but to me, down here, you can, you can really maximize down there. And in a program like ours, that's something we feel we have to do. Okay? We have to do to have a chance you know, to compete with the, you know, the brand name schools. But that's something we really kind of hold in on there. Uh, the only thing I'll throw in there, too, is, you know, we're, we're not uh, in Iowa. You know, we. Again, I think, you know, your audience, all that stuff, you know, we know who we are, we know what we are. I think, I think we've come to a pretty good uh, 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 grasp of that. Uh, you know, we're not like one of those amusement parks, you know, where, you know, you go there and, you know, you got to be this tall to ride the ride. You know, you guys all seen those in amusement parks. Okay, you know, if we are at some of those other schools, we'd probably have one of those bars, you know, when the recruits walk in. But, you know, we don't, and I'm glad we don't. And I'll go back, you know, I figured that out when I was there in the 80s. One of our best players, uh, we had a kid named Mark Sendlinger, uh, who we had, a, you know, we had to snatch him away from uh, Northern Iowa. He had an offer from a scholarship. Uh, he was an excellent wrestler in our state. This kid was, uh, he's six foot, maybe six foot and a half. Uh, wrestled at 225 back then. This is in the 80s. They had a super heavyweight <coughs> category, 225 on up. Mark had, it, uh, unlike most wrestlers, he had to eat to make weight. Okay, you know, he was an actual 220. 218 pound guy, but he had to eat to make his 225, and then he'd go out and wrestle with these big guys. He was a three time uh, state champion, all right, in our state. And, and what we had to do, we had to sell his dad on that, you know, we thought he was good enough to play it out. You know, dad, dad didn't believe it, you know, one of those types of rules. And he was an okay football player, good football player at Charles City, <coughs> uh, but, you know, we saw this guy wrestle three straight years, and he, he's flipping these big guys around. The guy's just a smart, tough, tenacious competitor. Uh, anyway, so he ends up coming to our place in 1983, uh, ended up being our backup center in 83 to a guy named Joel Hilgenberg, Jay's, Jay's younger brother. Uh, Joel ended up being an all-pro with the uh, Saints. So uh, another undersized guy was 235 in his senior year in 83. Now Mark ends up being a three-year starter on three of our better teams at Iowa in the 80s. And, uh, you know, see, like I said, you learn from your players. You know, here's a guy who's a hell of a football player, all right, and we, we were able to play pretty well against, you know, all, all the teams on our schedule with him playing center. So I've, I've never really bought into that thing about, you know, guys got to be this, this, and this. You know, the more recent example, Bob Sanders, you probably saw him playing for the Colts the last couple weeks. You know, Bob, Bob is an excellent football player for us, but, you know, he couldn't get in uh, Kennywood's where I, you know, Kennywood is the amusement park in Pittsburgh where I grew up. If Bob went to Kennywood, he wouldn't be allowed to ride the Thunderbolt because, you know, he's, he's only five foot eight. okay? So, you know, he wasn't allowed, allowed on the roller coaster, but, you know, he's a hell of a football player. I'm glad he wasn't 6'2 because he would have gone to Penn State. Right? No doubt about that. But, you know, we got him because he was 5'8. So my point there is, you know, we're not big on, on, on those parameters. And if you look at us, not only last year, but over the years, you know, we're probably in the bottom third for size, you know, weight, I should say, with our offensive linemen and our defensive linemen. To us, that's not that important. We'd rather get guys that, you know, can block and play block. So you know, those are just some things that we look for when we're, uh, we're talking talking about our guys. Okay.
a couple things, just uh, fundamentals. You know, and uh, just in general terms right now, I think whether you're talking about run or pass, you know, there's some things that are, that are just kind of basic. First of all is the stance. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're a little bit, uh, you know, just, I think you just got to try to be commonsensical. I should have said that earlier. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways to coach linemen. Uh, I've never been a, you know, I don't think you want to make players robots. I think it's true in every position. You know, every guy's different. You know, every body's different. Every kid's different. You know, so we don't necessarily, you know, cookie cutter uh, our guys. You know, we, we don't try to make them robots. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of fl flexibility in there. I, I guess maybe the best analogy I can give you, you know, when guys go in the weight room, uh, you know, with Chris, you know, they're, they're working certain areas, you know, and I think, um, I think you really want to concentrate on what's important in coaching. So, you know, I've been around some line coaches, excellent line coaches, but boy, they're way too technical for me, they're way too smart for me, and, uh, you know, again, I go back to my mentor, Joe Moore, he was kind of commonsensical, and he just tried to focus. He had an ability to really get guys to focus on the couple of things that were really important. And, and I think, you know, if you make it too technical, uh, probably like a golf swing, you know, which I, I quit golf 10 years ago, but that's not good golf. But I, you know, I hear all these theories in golf, and, you know, pretty soon a guy can't swing a club because he's thinking about 10 things instead of a couple of things that are really, uh, uh, really important. So you know, we try to, you know, be commonsensical, but with the stance, obviously it's got to be balanced, it's got to be you know, comfortable. And if a guy's got a terrible stance initially, a good stance isn't going to be comfortable. You know, so I'm not saying, hey, let the guy do what's comfortable. Or, you know, it's not like you know the set. You say, do whatever the hell you feel like. You know, one of those deals. But you know, you got you got to. It's got to be comfortable. You get him in a stance that is comfortable. And good stance. Eventually, it will be. Your All right. I think you know, a stance needs to fit your offense. And then what you do. You know, we, we try to be a balanced offense, and we want to be in a stance that is balanced. If we're a wishbone team like Oklahoma in the 70s, heck yeah, you want your weight out forward. And then the other thing goes with that is you know, situations. You know, if it's third and a foot, your stance is going to be different than if it's third and 10 yards. You know, And then, again, I just tell our guys, hey, you know, the defense knows what the hell we're going to do. You know, it's third and 10, we're going to throw the ball. So, yeah, you might as well get in a, a stance that's advantageous. Same thing if we're down on the goal line or third and one. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're probably going to ram it in there. Or if we throw it, it's going to be play action. So yeah, we want our weight for just common sense of things. Okay. Basically, in a stance, we would just uh, we get our guys into normal athletic position. You know, feet are a little wider than shoulder width apart. All right. We ask them to, to, to uh, you know get get that good base. All right. Be able to shift their weight. Their weight ought to be balanced on their feet. They're not up on their toes. Not back on their heels. They're fairly balanced. And I think the key thing is, you know, you want your weight on the inside parts of your feet. All right. So you know. Kind of flat foot up, but the weight's really on the, on the front two thirds, three quarters of your foot. But the big thing to me is, you know, your toes are straight ahead or slightly out, a little bit out, and it's natural, all right? But the weight is on the inside parts of your feet, so you can really feel the ground and control the ground, all right? And that's to me where it starts. Next thing we have our guys do is, you know, get their feet like they want them, then put their hands on their knees. And, and uh, you know, again, they're, they're not bending at the waist. But to get their hand on their knees, they got to bend a little bit in, in the knees, all right? So you get low by moving your knees, bending your knees, and sinking your hips rather than bending at the waist. Uh, we talk to our guys about that all the time. All right, the next step for them, <clears throat> to me, is just now they just shift their elbows to their knees without resting on their on their thighs, okay? So just putting it down, no weight on your thighs. All you've done is get lower through your, through your uh, uh, lower body. Some flexion, again, that's what we're trying to uh, uh, talk about. They're always keeping a tuck in the back, no different than they would in the weight room. Okay, any exercise they do in the weight room, you know, they're not gonna, they're never gonna bend their back with a bar on their on their shoulders, never, ever. So it's the same same principle there. The elbows on their knees. Now we just ask them to drop either foot, right-handed stance, right foot, left-handed stance, left foot. Okay, nothing else has changed. They still got that good base, <coughs> weights inside out. <coughs> Excuse me. And all they've done is stagger a foot. And as far as a stagger goes for us, we typically tell them. Uh, their toes should be about the middle of the uh, up foot, or you know it might be as deep as uh, the heel. Okay, you know I, I'm okay on that. Okay, let them find a place that's comfortable. Two things that are kind of funny. I, I don't know <coughs> since I've been back in Iowa, our guys tend to be almost parallel. I, you know, usually guys want to get their foot too deep. For our guys, for whatever reason, they're always almost parallel. And we got to get them to stagger a little bit more. I can't explain that. One other thing that's totally unrelated, but I'll throw it in there. Our receivers line up like you know. 
six yards off the ball, or our slot, you know, our Z guys, the go off the ball guys, which, you know, you figure they'd be trying to cheat and get up on the line, right? I, I can't understand that, but anyway, it's, it's kind of the same thing. But that, that's what we do with our stamps. They got their elbows on their knees, and the only thing left to do is they just put their hand down. All right, it's not out and down, all right, it's not back, it's just kind of down in a natural position. But when they do that, there shouldn't be a real shift in the body. So, you know, if you go through that progression, okay, they, they come up, they got their hands, all right, elbows, okay, drop the foot, and then the hand just goes down. Again, it should just be a little lower through their lower body. That's what you're trying to really focus with the guys, is get, get lower in that lower body. If their weight goes way out when they do it, then that's wrong, all right, or if they're sitting way back on their on their heels, that's wrong too. So, you know, you just kind of watch it and make sure they're doing that. Uh, and that's kind of the deal. The big thing uh, outside of this, and I'll come back on the passing game, same way. You know, the flexion, the, the tension in their body should always be from the waist down. It's no different to me than running a sprint, because the first thing they're going to do out of their stance is, is, is move, right? We all agree on that. So, the first thing you're going to do, it's all about, you know, tension in the lower body. You want flexion in that lower body. Your legs ought to be uh, uh, ready to go, and your mind's got to be alert, but that upper body should be relaxed. All right? You know, you never run a 40 yard dash. You know, making a fist, you sure as hell don't want that in the stance. So their upper body's relaxed. Okay, this arm shouldn't be leaning on a leg. It should just be resting there. All right, and their first movement's going to be explosive wherever they go. So you get them in a good stance, and then you, you start from there. All right? First step, you know, it's critical, run, work, pass. I don't care what you're doing. Uh, it should be natural. It should be efficient. All right, and basically all your first step is where you're set in the passing game. All it does is put you in position. Uh, uh, to have success in making a block. Okay, you want to anticipate for their zone play. You know, it might be the guy slamming into your gap, all right? Or you got a pass responsibility on the slide, you know, a guy trying to slam to your gap. But I always told our guys, hey, you got to be anticipating that so you're ready to defeat the hardest thing. And then if that doesn't take place, fine. You know, then play through it. You know, play through it. You should never get caught uh, uh, if the defender does what's toughest for you to handle. That should never catch you by a surprise. I mean, that's the mental part there. Um, again, just on the first step, you know, be it the run game, you know, things you want to look for there. You know, a guy getting in that stance, hopefully it was a good stance. You never want to see a guy fall step, which is a common problem with linemen, right? They step backwards and move forward. Okay, if they're doing that, then you got to go back to the stance part. That ain't good, okay? Uh, you know, same thing in passing. If they can't get into a natural set position, from that stance and you got to adjust the stance. So we try to get the tans, stance taught and then the next thing is, you know, practicing the movements that are in your offense. And I think, you know, usually everybody's got to run forward, you know, angles, all right, turn and pull, okay, and then the various pass sets. So, you know, you look at that stance and the guy should be able to do them all from that stance or whatever your offense requires a guy to do, uh, or, or it's not right. You, got, you know, you got to rethink it or redo it. And, and uh, so that's the first thing we'll teach guys. Okay, aiming points, every block, you know, you have an aiming point on a if it's a run or pass. And there's something you need to be focused on. And an aiming point to me is something very specific, some point of the defender's body. All right. But again, it's like driving a car. You know, you're, you're looking, you know, where you're going, but, you know, you got to see the big picture. And I don't remember much from high school, but, you know, GBP, you know, get the big picture. All right. That's something I remember from driver's ed. You know, and it's no different than the block in there. So you got to get, you know, you got to have focus. You got to see the big picture, get that experience, uh, and then, you know, to me, that's how you're going to aim your pads or your hands. In the running game, you know, you're aiming your shoulder pad. In the passing game, it's all about your hands getting there, get hands to the aiming point. Uh, now, flashback, you know, when I was in the island in the '80s, uh, every spring I'd go back. It worked out beautifully. University of Pittsburgh would start spring ball uh, the week we had spring break. You know, about the Tuesday of spring break. So. I'd always go back to Pittsburgh to see my family. My wife's from Pittsburgh. It worked out beautifully. So we got to see both parents. And on Tuesday, you know, I'd go down to Pitt and watch Joe coach for about four days. So it was a good, good break. They had a guy, Randy Dixon, who played, ended up playing for the uh, Colts. Uh, I think Randy, give me a little help on this, but like 83, 85, somewhere there, he was a senior at Pitt. And they had a lot of great linemen at Pitt. But one thing I remember uh, watching Randy, and this is something too about line. A lot of times I'll, you know, I'll stand on the other side of the ball and watch the linemen, you know, watch them coming out at you. Randy Dixon was one of those guys, and I have no idea what his test score was, SAT, ACT, but when he came out of the huddle, well, I never saw a guy with a focus like he had. You know, he came out, he'd get in, get in his stance, and 
that ball snapped, boy, his eyes were always riveted on where they were supposed to be. And consequently, the guy had pretty good technique. You know, it's kind of like hitting a, ba a baseball or a golf ball or shooting a basketball. You know, you got to have a focus point and really be able to, to uh, concentrate on that. And, uh, you know, it sounds simple. Randy Dixon's etched in my memory because I've never seen a guy with better focus than, than this guy. You know, and he's a pretty good, good football player, too. Uh, the next part about blocking is leverage. You know, you got you got to win the battle of leverage, and, and those guys on defense are trying to do the same thing. There's two kinds of leverage: up and down leverage. You know, the pad level, okay, our pads under their pads, and then in and out leverage. You know, the battle for getting your hands and elbows inside. Again, when you watch film, and you know, we do a lot of filming of our linemen from behind, and then again, very simple coaching points. You know, the side sideline gives you a little better shot of the pad level, and I think that is important if you have that ability of uh, intercutting your tapes or. Now, if you're a line coach, you just watch those end zones. Uh, but it's important to watch that sideline tape, too, to get perspective on, on your pad level. And, and we try to drill from all angles, too. You know, we'll show our guys from behind, show them from the side. All right? But when we're watching those end zone tapes, it's very, very simple. You know, if you see a guy's hands outside or his elbows outside the framework of his body, then, then that's something you want to correct. You know, you train your guys to see that uh, so they're on top of it. All right? And the last part, it's just the finish, you know, and that, that's just, you know, it gets back to, the, you know, the guy's uh, uh, drive, his attitude, you know, really wanting to finish the play and, and work hard to, uh, you know, to win the battle out there. Okay, we're moving into run blocking. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than the other Alabama. You know, they're cheap, really. You know, I say cheap, you know, 25, reasonable. A couple lot cheaper than a seven-man slip, okay? They're, they're like 25 bucks a shot or 30, I don't know what they are. But, uh, you know, but they're like a, a little bigger than this briefcase and really not a lot thicker than this. Okay, and they've got one handle on the top, two on the bottom. I, I take it back, two on the top, one on the bottom. Uh, but basically what, what the guy does, he just grabs the two straps on the top with, with uh, uh, the left hand. Or, I'm sorry, this all screwed up, all right? So the guy's gonna come to the left shoulder, the guy takes the bag in his right hand right here, puts it over his left shoulder with his left foot up. All right, so if a guy's coming to reach me like that, you take that bag with both hands, and, and the reason I'm doing this, you know, every time we use our bags, our guys do them wrong. They want to grab like this, hold them, they give the guy a crummy look. But if you take those shields, all right, with the one hand, and, and then you really bend, I can right, get the thing down here. It gives the guy a nice flat blocking surface. <clears throat> and then once the guy makes contact, all right, you can take that bag and really give him resistance through his neck. All right. And, and one thing uh, I'll just say, this is the opposite here. What, whether you're doing a drill. Uh, body on bag or body on body, you know, I think we probably spend as much time coaching the guy on defense as we do the guy on offense. Because, you know, the quality of your drill is going to be dictated by the guy holding the shield or the guy that is the defender, you know, just pad on pad. So we always tell them what tempo we're looking for. And just like, you know, our linemen are always too high, well, the defenders are always too high too. So if the guy is going to hold his shield, you know, you got to really teach him to get his, you know, get his hips down, bend his knees, hold that thing down there low. All right, or if he's playing in, in a uh, uh, defensive position, we want to try to keep them. And we just put them in a four-point stance, and then we tell them the kind of resistance we're looking for. And obviously, we always start slow and then build up to better tempo uh, and go from there. All right, but that, that's, that's really important. I think you got to coach the defender no matter what you're doing, shield or no shield. All right, so uh, point there. And obviously, you know, you move the defender depending on the drill. We'll get into that later on. Okay, stance. We talked about the first step. You know, aiming point. A leverage finish, we already talked about that stuff. Okay, to me, the keys in run blocking, okay, to me, the hands are very, very secondary. And I think we're probably a little bit against the norm in this field. Uh, quick story on that one. Uh, I think that was like 85. You know, Joe was fooling around with it uh, in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> he was trying to get the hands a little bit more involved. And this is way before those rules were changed. Yeah, but we were thinking about, you know, hey, more hands involved in the running game. So, yeah, he got it up and running there, and there's an 85. I was there for about three, four days, came back, and we started doing the same thing. And, and we got through about halfway spring or a third of spring, and uh, Bruce Kittle was the guy working with me. and played for us in 81. He'd been with us four years. And Bruce is a pretty sharp guy. We looked at each other. Uh, we're watching these tapes. And I said, you know, we're really getting good at getting our hands in that run game. But I said, you know, we're, we're not really coming off the ball anymore. And, and that's what we found. You know, our guys were doing awesome, you know, bam, getting their hands in there. But what they were doing is their feet weren't coming at all. And, and their pads were coming up. To get the hands and their, their pads were coming up. So we really got that down. It was about five, you know, back then it was 20 days of spring ball, six, seven days into it. And we're really getting good at that. But 
we're not coming off the football at all in the run game. So, you know, I kind of looked at him and I got on phone with Joe and Joe was thinking the same thing at the same time. You know, so we kind of threw that out and went back to what we're used to. And, and the way we teach run block is really no different than the way I was taught by Joe Moore uh, back in 1972 on the blacktop basketball courts outside of our uh, uh, high school there. You know, that's just how we did it. So, what, you know, we really believe hands are secondary, okay? I think if a player thinks about his hands in the run game, again, their pads tend to come up and, and their knees don't come with them. So we try to go the other way around. What we tell our guys is, hey, think of your shoulder pad as a fist. Okay, it's about as simple as that. Think of your shoulder pad as a fist. And the objective is to get your fist up underneath that guy's chin. Okay? So the only way to do that, the only way to do that, you have got to bring, I used to say bring your feet, and you're always learning. I was in Cleveland, I guess, and I used to go to see Joe of Notre Dame. And he's talking about the knees to the guys. That made a hell of a lot more sense to me than feet. You know, knees, you know, a little more, more powerful connotation. So we talk to our guys about getting their knees working. You know, if you hear Chuck Moll talk, you know, talks about same shoulder, same knee, all that kind of stuff, or, you know, right leg, right shoulder. It's all, all the same stuff. All right? Trying to get that pad and that knee to the defender. That, that's, that's the mission. So if I'm coming to block a guy, I'm going to my right, and I want to get my left pad under his chin, I've got to get my backside knee with me. Okay, my left knee has got to come, all right, and whatever that aiming point is based on the play, you know, that, that's the objective. So we talk to our guys about, you know, getting their, their pad, pad there. they got to bring their knee to get their pad there. And then the hands are important. I'm not saying they aren't, aren't important, but they're on that secondary list, okay? Again, you know, we got things we really try to get our guys to focus on, and then we coach that secondary stuff if there is a problem. So that, that's kind of how we do that. All right, and I already talked about, you know, the elbows in. You know, uh, I put that under no wind up. We don't teach the wind up. You know, the Washington Redskins uh, ran the ball great, you know, in the 80s with Joe Bugle. And he used to teach those guys, you know, wind up and bring the hands. So, you know, I mean, we're pretty good for them. I'm not saying that's one, but it's just something we don't teach. Uh, and as far as the hand placement, as far as, far as the hand placement, those hands ought to be fitting up. We, we, we try to talk to them about, you know, the hands ought to be coming in. Right, right down there in the bottom, the short ribs down there. That's, that's really where a guy's hands ought to be. Uh, and I know when we start out, for the bull practice most recently, uh, we start out in December. It's going to be this way on March 22nd. We start practicing, and we get to August camp. It's the same, it's the same stuff every time you start. I promise you, our hands are going to be up there. Our guys will be hitting. They'll be thinking about their pads. Uh, their hands are either going to be up on top of the pads, or they're going to be outside. Uh, I'll make that prediction right now with our most veteran guy. You know, we're going to see that, so you just start coaching it. You know, same battle every time you go out. You know, you that. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, you got to get your feet in the ground. Yeah, you can't be strong or powerful without your feet on the ground. It's impossible. Same thing as the weight room again. You know, guys don't squat with one foot on the ground. You know, you, you can't block that either. So, you know, we talk to our guys about you know, being efficient with their steps. All right. To me, it's more important uh, uh, to have the feet on the ground. You know, if a guy gets caught with a foot up, that, that can be pretty. Uh, so, you know, they got to understand how to keep their knees with them, all right? So they're fighting to keep their helmet play side, their pads square. Okay, you know, we're not, we're not big on, you know, making contact and trying to turn, getting our butts in the hole so the backs have nowhere to go. Uh, we work and drill real hard on, on getting that pad in the proper aiming point, whatever it may be, inside, outside. <clears throat> and once they get to that aiming point, then, then straining through the man. To me, that's blocking. Okay, blocking is not, you know, jumping around a guy and pinning him. You know, you may have a play where you do that. I'm not saying you don't, you know, pitch or something like that. But, you know, when we're trying to run the ball, you know, tight end to tight end, that, that's what we're looking to do. We want to get our aiming point and then start working through the defenders instead of just, you know, taking it out to the sideline and what have you. Okay, right along with that, you know, there's certain, you're going to play, play a face front, you know, where, hey, that guy's coached, you know, I'm never going to get reached. I'm never going to get reached, so, uh, you know, you make that, that step for that aiming point, bang, he's, he's skating, he's going hard. Uh, that, that's fun. I mean, if the guy's not going to get reached, he's not going to get reached. And to me, your system has to uh, uh, accommodate that. So for, uh, for us on that one, okay, and, and we'll drill this. You know, the, hey, the guy jumps out, he's going to stay. Well, now instead of a, a left shoulder block, it becomes a right shoulder block. But I'm still going to take that, take that guy and I'm going to press him, okay, now knowing now knowing that he jumps outside, our back is not going to, he's going to stretch the guy and all that stuff. But at some point, he's got to make a decision and cut up inside. And he ain't going to get outside if we can't reach him. So in that drill, 
All right, now you practice it, get the guy outside, now you just shift it over to the other shoulder. And, and now the key thing is, hey, if that happens, the lineman's got to understand the back eventually is going to bring it back inside. All right, and uh, as a result, what you can't do is let that guy cross heads. So, you know, hey, I went for the reach, I couldn't get it. Now I'm going to keep the pressure on, and now I'm going to keep the guy over here. I'm going to keep him on my, my uh, outside shoulder and then go from there. And then the last part, again, is just training through, you know, finishing the block. Okay? Well, let me just kind of run through them. I'm uh, coming down on time here. But let me run through the things that, uh, that we work on, and then after the break, we'll come back and just throw some of the stuff up on tape and, and uh, kind, of, kind of catch it out a little bit. And again, I, I think. Uh, I think all this stuff is, is kind of predicated by what you do offensively, but uh, you know, scratch that street, man. You know, basically to me, you, you got two blocks you're going to teach. Base blocks, all right. You, you got a tight reach or just a reach, all right, and then a wide reach. So you know, the first one for us is like an inside type running play. Yeah, you know, we're going to really come out and, and take the guy heavy. Okay, our aiming point's going to be heavy on that play side number, and, and you know, basically we're just coming off and trying to get on that guy and now strain back through him. Okay, and you know, to do that, we'll practice it with the defender, the bag on the guy pretty heavy, you know, proper footwork, get that knee and pad through the guy's crotch, you know, and, and take him straight back, and then I'll show it to you on tape. Then the next thing you're gonna do is move the guy out wide. Okay, so, and again, you can put foot to foot, it's kind of like pass sets, you gotta practice the various uh, alignments you are gonna see. And now your footwork certainly is gonna be different. Rather than being pretty aggressive, uh, to me, now you've got, you know, you've gotta give a little ground, with that, that uh, play side foot, because if you don't, you know, you end up getting that, that backside knee. It's not in a position where you can come through scoring straight on the guy. So, you know, and when we get to that, we'll put the defender wide, and I explain to our guys, hey, we all understand we took geometry. You know, the fastest way is just angle and go get him. But if you do that, you know, he's going to be square and we're going to be turned, and that's really not what we're looking for. So we're trying to do, do a drill now where, you know, we're going to get the proper footwork, the guys get the feel uh, uh, on how to, you know, give them a little ground so they get their backside knee and pad to the aiming point and be strong where they can compete in a uh, battle with the guy. Okay? Now, you know, you ask about, the, and we'll show you the, the footwork on tape, all right? But, you know, what's the proper footwork for a guy? You know, it's kind of like pass sets a little bit. You know, it depends on the guy's quickness, his ability level, <coughs> those types of things, you know? So, uh, uh, the more limited the guy is physically, you know, he may have to step a little deeper or drop, give him a little more ground so he can get to the position he's got to get to. You know, a quicker guy can cut the corner a little bit more. I mentioned that guy, Joel Hildenberg. You know, he was like a jet out there, uh, one of the quickest guys I've ever been around. You know, bang, he could get on a guy pretty quick before the guy knew uh, what he was doing. So that's, that's a little bit of an ability. Uh, the other things I think you, you know, you got to work on, you know, most people have some kind of a down scheme in, in their uh, uh, offense. You know, we're going to down block. You know, it might just be a pitch play you know, where the tackle's down block and on an uncovered tackle blocks down on a three technique. The guards pulling. That might be a center. A guards blocking down on a power scheme or a counter scheme, or anything like that. Down blocks are a little bit different, and uh, you know, I'll just say this on that. To, to me, those are more finesse type blocks. You know, now, now our hands are a little bit more primary than a shoulder pin, because all we're trying to do is pin a guy and, and hold him in a spot rather than trying to drive him. So you know, that, that's one there. You know, we're trying to do that. A couple quick things on that. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, years ago, I, I teach a guy to be kind of aggressive with that forward. Now, to me, we almost look just like a pivot. A pivot. The guy just kind of pivots on his back, inside heel, and gets his toe turned where, where he's really looking at the nape of the guy's neck. So coming down from that side or that side, you know, that's your focal point. And, and I think what you have to practice there, obviously, is a guy trying to come up the field. Uh, and, and then uh, the other thing is a guy, you know, playing across the hat or a spin. And, and again, plays kind of dictate that. You know, if, if it's a tackle walking down on a sweep or an outside play, you know, if the guy shoots inside, that's really not the end of the day on that one. So, you know, you're really playing for more up the field or cross hat. Uh, uh, you know, if it's a uh, guard coming down on a power scheme, yeah, you better not let the guy penetrate. So, you know, you got to be smart on your angles there. All right. And I'll go back one other thing, too. Uh, you know, you practice cutting off the penetration. Now the guy's going to cross hats. To me, all it comes down to there. He makes his move. Again, it's about you know getting your knee upfield, your outside knee now, and now you put the guy on your inside pad and really take it. You practice that, you drill it. The other thing you might get, you know, a guy's getting down block and he runs a spin. Okay, and on that now it's more of a finesse. It's almost like a pass block for the offensive lineman. Right there, butchering. Uh, blocking linebackers. 
Okay, to me, no different than blocking a down guy, other than, other than, you know, if, you, if you're holding, and you got to practice all this stuff or they're not going to do it well. You know, not, not the guy with the shield, there's some separation between the down guy and the shield. You change the angles again. You still have the guy down low, uh, and, and again, you got to practice that. The one thing, and this fits right in with the trap as well, uh, the one common denominator to me, when linemen block in space, they naturally come up, right? I mean, you're fighting that battle to keep them low on down, guys, but when they go to block a linebacker, go to trap, pull and block a linebacker, it's just natural they come up high. So you got to coach the heck out of that. And, and to me, it starts with practice and you drill it just like you would anything else. Yeah, those guys with the shield hold it low. So, you know, the guy's got to make his approach, and as he gets close, he's got to get his hips down just like any other football player so he can get that leverage. All right, and they've got to understand, you know, you got a 250 pound lineman and a 200 pound linebacker. Linebackers aren't that dumb, all right? You know, they understand they better get leverage to win, win that battle. So, you know, that, that's what you got to do as a, uh, a coach is practice that. Trap blocks, uh, you know, to me are no different than any other block there. Very simply, and, and uh, I'm not going to get into the pull technique, but we make pulls real easy. It's, I mean, it's just a matter of turning your eyes and running. You know, it's very natural. There's nothing exaggerated about the elbow. It's footwork. You know, it's just natural. Just turn your eyes and run. That's how you pull. And, and I think the biggest thing on trapping, uh, you know, any kind of traps, uh, you know, you got to just keep uh, emphasizing getting up in the line. Getting up in the line. And to me, a trap block is very simple. If I'm going to the left, all right, as a trapper, I want to trap with my left shoulder. If I'm going to the right, I want to trap with my right shoulder pad. And your aiming point is the defender's inside hip. It's no more complicated than that, OK? So if I'm going there, it's my right pad on his inside hip. If I'm going there, it's my left pad on the inside hip. All right? Our guys at, at Iowa, you know, we, we try to run counters, and, and uh, powers are tough, because our guys really do a heck of a job of squeezing a cross arm. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. But I, I think this, I'll say this about it. The, uh, to me, the coaching point there, if the guy, is the offensive guy, does a good job of staying in line, uh, and he keeps true to the, the concept of inside pad, or excuse me, you know, the proper pad on the inside hip. Okay, now if that defender is going to cross cross arm, it's no different than a fullback on the par. You know, fullbacks are always too wide, right? So you got to get them inside out. If that guy cross hatch you, okay, which they're being taught to do, if you do take your, stay true to your theory, all right? That pad on that inside hip. Well, now, at the moment of truth, I can't get with my approach. It all gets back to the approach. If I squeeze that line, I forced him to squeeze it too. So now I got a natural pin, and then the second blocker, it's a guard on a power or uh, whoever on the counter, okay? You know, the guard might be the lead guy on the counter, and it's a tackle or an H back or something like that coming to fullback. You know, it's, it's a, natural, a natural bounce instead of, you know, having the thing strung out. So to me, it's all about the collision taking place at a certain point. If, if we're on their side of the line of scrimmage and close to the center, then we've got a chance to, to bounce that thing and hit it downhill instead of our back, you know, going lateral, which kills the play, and that's why they're doing it. So I, I think it's, you know, again, it comes down to the course and the uh, 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 proper angle. Moment of truth, just change. You know, the guy, next guy reacts naturally. You've got to practice, obviously. Okay, last, last two things, and then we'll just come well out three things. We jump down to cut blocks. I talked about, you know, the two most overlooked things, I think, you know, you can overlook the block and linebackers, and most people don't practice that enough, you've got to practice it, and cut blocks are the same way, and that's hard. But, you know, uh, cut blocks on screens, you know, downfield, all that kind of stuff, you've got to practice, and we just used to tall, those tall stand-up dummies, and then and have the guys caught them, we film it so, so the guys can see themselves. All right, the, the thing we like to do is practice the individual skills, and then a lot of two-on-one and two-on-two. Work. To me, it all starts out with two-on-one. Everything, if you're a zone block team or combo blocks, it all starts with a, a two-on-one. We just call it blade drill. And then all it is, you know, it's two guys and the defender. And usually we'll put right on a line, so that defender is going to split that line. And we just have these two guys hook into that guy and, and blow him off the ball. So it's two guys on one, bang fit in and they learn how to use each other's uh, you know each other's inertia if you will. All right. So you know the concept is to create a, like a bulldozer blade or a snow plow. Two guys working together and, and I don't care, you know, if you can get that down where guys get good at that and get confident with each other, to me that's the start of everything you do in zone blocking or combo blocking. <clears throat> so we start out with that drill, then on the next step there, 
is you put a defender in at about five yards and just wait till these guys are about three and a half, four yards and they have the defender step off either way. So they learn how to work in combination. All right? They learn how to do that. We'll spend, it's a very basic thing, but we spend time on that. Uh, end of season, just like the early season. And then from there, you get into your, you know, your combos and your zones, all that kind of stuff. I'll come back to that. That, that really is, to me, the foundation right there. You got, you got to learn how to, you know, get that, that one-on-one -on -one skills down, and then it evolves to two-on-two. -two. I had five on seven down at the bottom. That, that's uh, step, you know, 15 or whatever. But you know, just want to get those basics down. So we'll, we'll take a break, then I'll pop the tape. The players that I've had the pleasure of coaching with the last uh, 22 years that I've been at Mount Carmel.